I think that I probably know many of you quite well, and, and you know me, and yet you chose to come anyway, which um, is a little surprising. But uh, for those of you who don't, I'm Tori Holler. I'm part of a group, Center for Life Detection, that is a, a collaboration between Ames and Goddard, supported by PSD to do basic research and also community service in the area of life detection. And so what we're talking about today, the Life Detection Forum Project, is part of our community service. Um, I'm gonna introduce the folks to my left in just a minute here, but before I do, I wanna thank the organizers for making time for this in what I think was a very oversubscribed um, town hall schedule. Uh, I, I think it's been a real juggling act to put this meeting together and, and well done. Thanks also to all of you. Um, I know I'm kind of exhausted at this point in the meeting uh, and I look for things that I can not go to if, if given the chance, so I really appreciate your being here um, for this and I, and I hope it will be worthwhile for you. So here's the ground that I want to try to cover tonight. First, just a little bit of the motivation for the Life Detection Forum project. Um, I'm going to focus in on something called the Life Detection Knowledge Base, which is the, the key and central module of this tool that we're developing. And we'll do that in a few ways. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the basic idea and purpose behind it, something about the conceptual basis for it, and then to make it tangible. And because it is a built system, um, we're going to have a live tour, uh, or hopefully if we can make the technology work, we're going to have a live tour. Um, Graham Lau to my left is going to be the person giving that tour, and, and um, he's our best chance for surviving the, the technology of it. Um, then, you know, one of the things that we really hope to do when building this tool is suit multiple purposes and serve multiple users. And one of the key things for us was doing something that would provide an educational tool. Uh, and a very valuable partnership for us for the last few years has been working with Jen Glass um, here at Georgia Tech to use the life detection knowledge base in the context of her course. And so we're very fortunate to have both Jen and Claire Elbon. Um, so this is uh, instructor and student in this class to talk a little bit about the life detection knowledge base in its use specifically in that class. Um, after we do that, I'll spend a little bit of time on what comes next in the project, what we're working on now, how you can be involved. Um, this, is, this is part letting you know what's going on, part trying to recruit you into the project a little bit. So we'll talk about that. And I really hope to leave a good bit of time at the end for questions. That to me is the most important part, is to know what you think about this, um, hear your feedback. So let me start with a little bit of context and motivation. During the three years since the last EBSICON, kind of a lot has happened, and, and a couple of really big things have been the release of the decadal surveys in astronomy and astrophysics and in planetary sciences and astrobiology. I think in both of those cases, you know, I hope that all of you or some of you had a chance to um, take part in the, in the decadal town hall earlier this week or have read them, had a chance to digest them. Astrobiology is prominent. Uh, in these two decadal surveys. And in particular, I think life detection missions uh, take front and center in both of them. Uh, it's a real thing in the coming decades. And as much as that is for sure based on the amazing set of observations that have come back from spacecraft and telescopes, it also rests very much on the interpretive context that this community has built. Um, and I think that's something to be proud of, uh, that, that we have provided some of the impetus for taking these important next steps. So I think we can look very much forward to what's ahead. Uh, I think that we can be proud of our role in, in having made some of that possible. I also think it levies a lot of responsibility on all of us to marshal our knowledge and our expertise in the very specific way that is required to parameterize and define missions. And that's something I think the exoplanet community has done consistently and well, and I think it's something that we really need to strive to do in the planetary science community as well. That's a lot of what we're talking about tonight, and, and whether you um, like this particular approach to doing it or not, I, I urge everyone to begin thinking about how we can bring our knowledge to bear to make these missions happen in the best and most rigorous way possible. So really, the Life Detection Forum concept is, is designed to provide a tool that catalyzes that process of looking at this really broad, diffuse, diverse body of knowledge that's been created by this community over the last few decades and distilling out the pieces that are specifically relevant to mission conceptualization and design. And in particular, to do it in a way that the results are accessible to everybody and able to be updated on a continuing basis. And so we envision this as sort of a living online suite of tools that's community-based, user-based, and living. And here's the basic idea. 
The basic idea is that if we take what we have come to understand about biosignatures, or at least things that might serve as evidence for life, it gives us some insight into how we should design mission objectives. It gives us some insight in cases where there are knowledge gaps into what our research priorities should be. And if we then compare that with our understanding of the technology that's available or in development to measure these things that might serve as evidence for life, we can do two more important things. We can try to establish science traceability. Um, if that's a new term to some of you, it basically means the logic flow from science goal to proposed payload element. And where that logic flow is incomplete or interrupted, it identifies technology development priorities for us. And so the idea behind the system has been to build these two components and be able to make this comparison on an ongoing basis. And so the one on your left, uh, the part that has to do with biosignatures, is a built system that we call the life detection knowledge base. That's what we're going to talk about mostly here tonight. The one on the right, the component that has to do with technology um, existing or in development, is something that we're trying to build now uh, and, and that we'll be interested in your feedback on. Everything that we've done to this point, everything that you're going to see presented tonight is a result of an effort to engage extensively with the community. And that started two and a half or three years ago at the last ABSICON, where we introduced the basic concept, um, tried to get people engaged and interested in what we were doing, and then has commenced with a series of workshops over time that have vetted the organizing basis for the life detection knowledge base, introduced the knowledge base, had a content development activity that served also for beta testing. Um, and most recently, we held a, a workshop called Future of, the, um, Future of the Search for Life workshop that really was about science and technology integration. And that's going to inform our next steps as we begin to develop the, the technology component of this. So let me talk a little bit about this life detection knowledge base. Really, this is the system that is designed to tackle what I see as a very diverse and diffuse body of relevant information, in some cases created within the astrobiology community, in some cases created in communities that historically have had no relation to space science, maybe haven't perceived their relevance um, to, NASA, to NASA missions or, or to light detection, but nevertheless have something real to contribute. Um, how do you manage that really diverse body of information and, and streamline it and collimate it in a way that makes it specifically relevant to life detection? That's what the knowledge base is supposed to be about. So I'm going to talk briefly about sort of three axes of organization for this knowledge base. One is a taxonomy of what we call features, potential biosignatures. A second is criteria for assessing those features. And finally, arguments and evidence. And I'll explain in a minute what that means. So briefly, the feature taxonomy, I think, is pretty simple to understand. Um, it starts with the three categories of potential biosignatures that are identified in the decadal, chemistry, morphology or structure, and activity, and then seeks to break them down to a taxonomic level at which you have some common level of granularity among all the things that you're comparing. And the idea is to be able to support an apples to apples comparison among all of the different signs of evidence that, that signs that we might seek as evidence for life. Um, we've tried as much as possible to make that level correspond, roughly speaking, to the level of a science investigation in a science traceability matrix, right? Something that you can actually tangibly place within the context of science traceability. For any of the features or potential biosignatures that appear within that taxonomy, we want to ask a specific and standard set of questions. And so we take as the basis for, for the way that we do this assessment a recommendation from the 2018 National Academy's uh, study on astrobiology strategy. They focused on assessing the potential for false positive and false negative. False positive being that you see a signal when life is actually not present. False negative being that life is present, but you see no signal at all. Both of those things matter to consider when you're designing mission objectives. So the decadal in planetary science that just appeared broke this down uh, one more step. And they said, in each of these cases, it matters to consider a more probabilistic component. So what is the likely prevalence? If, if life is there, what are the chances that it creates at all the signal that you're looking for? And if it does, how large in magnitude is that signal likely to be? And those are different things and, and each worth considering independently. You can ask that same set of questions both for biology and for abiotic processes that might produce mimics for what you're looking for. So these four questions, which we call criteria, are what we ask in a standard way of every single thing that appears as a, as a potential biosignature in the life detection knowledge base. 
So what I think is new to people, if, if you look at this sort of flow diagram, the upper two levels, the measurement type and the criteria, that's what we just talked about with the feature taxonomy and the criteria. What's new about this, and I think what will strike people as novel and a little difficult to, to wrap your heads around initially, is that for any given criterion, let's say it's, it's the abiotic prevalence of a particular feature, we ask users to, to take the existing scientific literature and distill from it very specific arguments that bear on that criterion. And we do this with a, with a series of arguments and evidence. So argument is, I think that the abiotic prevalence is high for the following reason. Evidence is a piece of scientific literature that specifically supports that argument. And so the idea behind this is that it represents a distillation of the broader literature into a very specific form that bears on the potential for false positive and false negative. So to try to make that just a little bit more tangible to you, I'll give you a specific example. This is pulled straight out of the life detection knowledge base. Um, you could go and look for it right now. Uh, so in this case, the measurement type in this specific example is enantiomer ratios in amino acids, one of the things that people have proposed as a potential sign of life. And the criterion in this example is the abiotic prevalence of that signal, meaning how often do non-biological processes nevertheless produce some excess in, in the enantiomer ratios. The argument that the creator of this thing has created, has, has put forward, um, is that some abiotic amino acids that are found in meteorites can have significant enantiomeric excess despite being created by non-biological processes. And the evidence for that specifically is that L excesses of aspartic acid and glutamic acid up to 60% were measured in Tagish Lake meteorite. And the literature from which that's drawn is Danny Glavin's 2012 paper. So that paper is one of three forms of evidence that support this particular uh, argument. That argument is one of four arguments that are relevant to um, the, the pro arguments for this criterion. And so there are 12 papers that have been sorted into a specific bearing uh, on potential for, for uh, false positives in this case. And so really overall, the idea behind the knowledge base is to catalyze this process of distillation. And it puts users on the hook to do it. And the idea behind it is there's a very standard portion that is the, the feature taxonomy and then the standard set of criteria, and then a very flexible portion that relies on user-defined arguments to place things in context, to acknowledge that different biosignatures are different, and nevertheless, find a way to channel that literature and distill it into, into a form that matters for mission design. So at this point, I wanna actually turn it over to Graham uh, and give us a little tour of the knowledge base so that you can see this process in action. So, Graham. All right, thank you, Tori. I'm gonna exit out of our slideshow here. So if you do wanna follow along, you can pull out your phone or your computer and go to ldfknowledgebase.com or check it out later. I'm gonna just a very brief tour of the site and how it works. Uh, on the home page, you have just a brief description of the knowledge base. But if we click enter, uh, we can go into the site and immediately see this taxonomy Tori was talking about where we have our branching kind of tree right here showing our categories um, for looking in life detection. So if we go to chemistry, we can see this tree opens up as a branching tree. Um, you can see these topics down below, like enantiomer ratios that Tori mentioned, uh, other topics within chemistry. Um, if I click on structure, um, the same thing. It brings up more of a tree with topics I can see down below them. Some of the entries that have material entered already um, now note the knowledge base is not yet complete. There's still a lot of room for entries provided by yourselves uh, and others. And so entries that currently have some content are black in their text here. There's other text that's gray right now. Uh, those are places where we foresee uh, future entries, future content being developed. Um, on each of these, there's uh, some background information at every single level of the knowledge base within this taxonomy. So within chemistry, I can click on background and it brings up a brief description at the very fundamental level of, of what chemistry is. Um, and looking at these, I can also download this background information as a PDF. Uh, I won't do that on this computer, but if you click download background anywhere, you get, oops, never mind, I did download it. Um, you get the, a PDF document showing the background. And if there are any images, you get that as well. Um, the same thing, so in every topic, there's some background information. You can click on that, see the background information provided to the website by our curators for each of these topics. Uh, every single entry has a curator who's responsible for ensuring the accuracy of the material, 
uh, ensuring the users are appropriately entering the material as well. Um, and so I'm just gonna go into one of these. Uh, from this page where you have this branching tree, uh, you can click on one of three biosignature categories. Uh, click on any of these black text boxes to bring up biosignatures that you're interested in. So I'll do a couple here in the isotopes uh, and then click go. And that brings me to another page where we can filter out the biosignatures of interest by certain environments that were selected by the community uh, to be relevant in life detection searches. Uh, so things like the surface or atmosphere of an exoplanet, uh, the surface or subsurface of Mars, um, or just all of those things um, allows us to search through these different biosignatures we've already selected to figure out which ones we want to look at. Um, so here we have isotope ratio patterns for carbon redox states. There's some background information. Uh, in this case, it also includes a picture. And so if I did download background here, it would download all of the text and images as well for offline reading. Um, there's a read more button in some cases that allows you to expand things and see where we've worked really hard to develop these background entries. Um, but the real power is in each of these potential biosignatures, when you go into one of them, so for carbon redox states, uh, we can see these different categories that Tori mentioned, things like prevalence and feature strength, both biological and abiotic. On any of these, if I, if I click this down arrow or click on the, the, the criterion, it then brings me to the place where I now have the arguments, both arguments pro and con for biological prevalence um, or arguments pro and con for abiotic prevalence. Um, and so for each of these, you can read the argument itself, a very simple statement uh, making the argument and then you can see where there's this evidence button that brings up the, the evidence pulled from the literature supporting these arguments. Uh, in any of those cases, I can click on that evidence piece and it takes me to uh, information that says what the evidence is, describing it fully, and then saying which piece of literature it's sourced from, um, and also giving me a way to download code for it so I can add it to my, my own citation manager. Um, you also can see the citation in different formats as well um, for finding the article. Uh, currently, there is a link button, but it doesn't actually link to the articles. Uh, hopefully in the very near future, you can also link directly to the literature offline of the website as well. Um, a few more things with the website. Um, so for those who maybe aren't used to using uh, websites like this, there, there is a help page. Uh, and an about page. The about page will give you some more information on this project, the development of the site in general, uh, lay out some of these categories and criteria that we use within the site as well. Um, so if you're interested, I, I'd highly recommend reading all of this. Um, but then for those who want to use the site, there is a help page that walks you through the whole process of registering, of contributing content to the site, uh, of adding comments on the site. E everywhere throughout that taxonomy, there's places where you can add comments to the site that will help us in our development of this material. Um, and so within help, we have lots of ways of registering, browsing. Um, eventually, we'll have an FAQ document here as well. Uh, if at any time when you're using the site, you have any issues, there's an email button that will allow you to send an email to myself as an administrator or to one of our curators uh, to let us know what the issue is you're having. Uh, or if you just want to have a conversation about the content, if you have an argument, um, to make about the content, uh, feel free to do that with us there. Uh, and then finally, if you do want to use the site, we highly recommend creating your own account. Uh, registering for an account will allow you to then make comments as well as contribute arguments and evidence towards these various potential biosignatures. Um, and then one more thing, there, there is a glossary. Uh, we realize there's a lot of nuanced language within the site. Uh, it does come from the literature, but for those who do have any questions, there's a very long glossary explaining uh, the definitions and some background material for every single one of the criteria for all of the, the nuanced language we use in the site. There's also some more specific uh, uh, language, primarily for structures or morphologies, since there's some language, you know, if you're not a geologist, you might not have heard some of those terms before, and so we have those in the glossary as well. Um, but you know, there is a lot of content here already. I mentioned it's not complete yet, but we've done a lot so far. There are many entries um, contributed by, by various users in the past. We had a criteria workshop, a, a knowledge-based workshop this past year, and we had several users contributing content. Um, and then recently, we've also had Jen Glass from Georgia Tech 
uh, have a class of, of graduate students who've contributed a lot of content to the site as well. And so I'm gonna have Jen come up and explain uh, what her class has done uh, in developing this content for the Knowledge Base website. All right, great, thank you, Graham. Uh, should I? Click your jump back to the oh, well, I have to click through. Yep. Resume presentation. There we go. Okay, I think that was it. All right. Okay, great. Uh, so thanks everyone for being here. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about how our class at Georgia Tech has been um, really helping to contribute to the knowledge base um, and also just how it really nicely kind of blends in with um, academic work uh, and scholarship. So this is our class. It's been going, uh, we've, we've done it three times and it is a core course for our astrobiology certificate graduate program at Georgia Tech. Uh, so every, every student that goes through our program is required to take this course. And as you can see, a major component of it is the science communication project. So this is where we contribute to the knowledge base. But we also have these weekly discussions where a student um, <clears throat> presents on a seminal paper. So you can see how this kind of really goes hand in hand. Um, and these are some of the papers that we did uh, this past year. And of course, they're seminal, so you probably recognize. Um, we always do, for instance, um, uh, the Stanley Miller paper, for instance, um, if you like that. Um, and uh, so the way this assignment went, uh, first of all, we, we <clears throat> spoke with our wonderful NASA um, Center for Life Detection colleagues, and they they recommended us uh, this time. Kind of, we try to kind of have a different theme each semester. So I'm just going to focus on this past spring. We had um, the theme of uh, Mars, and so we did the McKay 1996 paper, and then we did the the Viking. What is it? 1970. <laughs> whatever paper, okay? And so they read those those two seminal papers in addition to all the other seminal papers they wrote. And, uh, and, and this is really important, I think, for the students. The reason we make them do all these seminal papers is so they really understand the history, the deep history of this field, which I think, which I think we can agree is so important, understanding how this field, if you went to the event last night, goes all the way back to, you know, to the 50s and, and even before. Um, and so understanding how to each student really seeing the, how the scholarship has grown through time, how they are really, you know, um, building, standing on the shoulders of these giants and how their work just builds from this timeline of papers and who all, who all their academic ancestors were. This is kind of part and parcel of, of that process. So we, these are the assignments that we go through. So you can see we've kind of broken it up um, into a series of assignments. Um, basically, they read and understand the seminal papers. Um, they, they tell us which one they're most interested in. They learn about the database. Meanwhile, they're having office hours the whole time with every week um, for NASA scientists, may, and, and as well as Graham made their time available for an hour for these students. They create annotated bibliographies with three pieces of pro and con evidence, as you saw. And then they group those evidence into pr uh, pieces of evidence into pro and con arguments. We start learning about the hierarchies then between what is evidence, what is arguments, <laughs> um, et cetera. Uh, what is prevalence? What is signal strength? All these things. So we talk a lot about that. Um, they write background summary compile, then they do peer review. So this is a really good practice with what is peer review and, and that whole process. Then they even do response to peer review. So that's super good practice too. They edit their contribution and they then they create an account and upload it and final presentation. So it, you can see it's a pretty involved, involved process. And I'm happy to provide the full copy of the assignment if you'd like. So here's um, some of the contributions that our students with their names and, and pictures have made. You might recognize. Uh, so Elizabeth Corbin, Hank uh, Rainwater, 
uh, Kavita Matonge and um, Tatiana Gibson, oops, uh, Jordan McKay, Ben Zussman, Lily Turner, Emmy and Jay. So they basically, our students have really kind of, and here is Claire, oh, spelled wrong, I forgot the hell, I'm sorry, Claire. Claire. I can't spell my own student's name, first name. Claire and Katie have made, um, and so you can see our fingerprints are kind of all over this. We're pretty proud of that. And so every, every week they had um, office hours with Andro, Alfonso, Dave Demeray, and Svetlana, and Graham, uh, and that was really special. So some of them really kind of came every week and got just, um, you can imagine, basically four, <laughs> four NASA scientists just, just you ask them any question and they just talk for an hour. And that was like, you can probably gain more knowledge then than, than ever. So it was really, really special. Um, and then this is, uh, this is some of the feedback we got. This is Ben said, one of the coolest class projects I've ever worked on because there's a tangible result. We got a lot of feedback like that. And, and here's our happy students getting their certificates. Um, so I'm happy to introduce now Claire, spelled correctly, Elvin, <laughs> who is a Georgia Tech Ocean Science and Engineering PhD candidate um, and uh, NSF GRFP fellow. And just got the astrobiology certificate and an astrobiology fellow. So I'm very happy to introduce Claire. Uh, who's going to tell you more about her specific contributions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Claire, and I got to participate in the spring 2022 uh, section of this class. And so I'm just going to talk a little bit about my uh, specific experience with it. Um, so I focused on the Viking lander experiments of 1976, um, and this really focused on metabolism as a biosignature. Um, so they did four main experience, uh, experiments, um, but what I focused on was the labeled release experiment, which is essentially where they were able to see um, when they were adding a radio labeled carbon into this Martian soil, they actually saw release of this labeled carbon into the above air, um, which was uh, very highly criticized and highly disputed whether or not it was a true positive. Um, so the, the question that I really focused on for this uh, course was what is the prevalence of an abiotic ex uh, signal in this experiment? Um, and that's just sort of an example of if it was a biotic signal, this is uh, the oxidation of formate. So this is um, a biological signal that they were inferring might be happening. But we're wondering here, okay, what are the abiotic prevalence? Um, so uh, it got cut off, but essentially uh, formulating an argument from literature review of a seminal paper can feel like you're drowning, especially when you're um, looking at a paper this far back. It can be really difficult to know where to get started and what to focus on. Um, so what really helped a lot was the NASA office hours. Um, they were able to provide as you said, you could, as Jen said, you can, you know, mention a singular topic and they'll have just such a broad and depth of understanding and knowledge of the papers and review and just talk for hours. It's great. Um, but two main points that were brought up to me that really helped me sort of hone in on this abiotic signal prevalence um, and the relevant papers for that criteria were uh, perchlorate and the Atacama Desert. Um, so that was really, really helpful because at that point I was able to start a more typical literature review process, uh, keeping those in mind in these highly relevant papers, and then work on those pro and con arguments based on the evidence from literature. So this is assignment seven. So this is sort of towards the end of our semester where we started to compile our contributions into the correct format for the LDKB upload. Um, and this, this was really helpful because up until this point, um, I hadn't even realized how much literature I had reviewed and how much I had really started to understand, you know, abiotic prevalence of metabolism, looking at 
Martian surfaces. Um, so that was really cool that um, we had done all of this back work. I hadn't even realized it until we got to this assignment when it was just like, wow, I've done a lot. Um, and it definitely would have been intimidating starting from this point. Um, and then the peer review process. Um, I really, really um, appreciated having this process because not only did we send um, peer review as like, oh, you should change this sentence or, oh, maybe you should shorten it, sh shorten this part or expand here. We um, did really what is more uh, journal submission style peer review where you had paragraphs um, summarizing what you read and then a point by point um, kind of a response to go through. And then um, so we, we sent that to each other and then the second half of the peer review was going through um, these um, responses and saying, what did I edit? What did I add? And then having this uh, corresponding document keeping track of all of this. Um, so that was really fantastic. And I know other students have mentioned it, um, but I will also say it again. It's really cool at the end of a class to not just turn in what you think is a good piece of work, but to be able to upload it and see it and, you know, send it to your parents and be like, look, this is what I'm doing. Um, so that was really, really enjoyable having something so tangible to, to contribute to. And uh, personally, I worked a little bit harder on it knowing anyone on the internet could access this with my name on it. Um, and this is just kind of like how I thought about this class working. So the LDKB is, you know, it starts off as very broad as this you know, structure, um, and you go down to category and topic and everything, uh, sort of centering on arguments and evidence. Uh, I feel like we kind of worked from the bottom up where there's so much peer reviewed literature on these seminal papers um, and you just become more and more and more specific and kind of hone in on that argument and evidence as well. Um, but yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Thanks very much to both of you. That was really great. I, I appreciate that. So um, just a few more minutes before we open it up for Q&A, and I want to focus on what comes next. And to do that, I like to return to the basic idea behind the whole system, which is that there's a lot to be gained by comparing and organizing our knowledge about potential biosignatures and about the technology that might be used to uh, to measure them. And in particular, I want to focus on this idea that that comparison allows you either to conceptually establish science traceability or in the absence of, of that link to identify technology development priorities and to give a sense of you know, how this is perceived at, at, at headquarters and, and the fact that this is a sought after thing to do. Um, I'll point to the future of the Search for Life workshop. I'll thank uh, Kate Kraft for this slide. Um, and the idea behind this workshop, really the impetus came from headquarters in part from the Astrobiology Program Office, in part from the PESTO, uh, the PESTO Office, Planetary Exploration Science and Technology Office, I think. Um, so from both sides, really both halves, the science and the technology represented with an eye toward trying to understand this, this science traceability and the need for technology development. So the appetite is really there for seeing this comparison made. And so that drives our next step, which is trying to build this second half to the system. So what comes next is something that for now we call the measurement technology module. The idea behind the technology module is that it will be something like a catalog of the methods that are applicable to measurement of a given biosignature or a given thing that appears um, in our system. Uh, and that along with it, you'll get citations to the literature that supports that use, describes how it's been used in different contexts before, and gives you links uh, to web content that already exists that, that allows you to dig deeper into that instrumentation. Uh, and in each case, for every entry in the knowledge base, there'll be a live link that you can click on that says, okay, well, I really would like to understand the different options that are available to me if I want to measure, for example, an anti-Americ excess. And clicking on that link will show you everything that sits in the measurement technology module that represents a potential to do that measurement. And the idea is to get us out of the specific patterns that, that you know, this is used to measure this and start to show us what the options are when we think a little bit more broadly and enable people to do that connection. And along with it, we hope to, to develop something called a science traceability tool. Science traceability is, is really the beating heart of, of conceptualizing a mission and defining a mission. And so we feel like giving the community an ability to visualize how that process works 
is really going to be important. And so this is a practical tool in part to understand how information like the information that's contained in the knowledge base and the measurement technology module maps into the different categories of a science traceability matrix. I don't know how many of you have encountered this, but it is a challenging thing to do when you come from the science side and first encounter that process. So this is meant to be an aid to understanding how to do that. And secondly, it, it, it is meant to help people establish concept level science traceability. So not quantitative science traceability, but at least is there a consistent logic flow from goal to potential measurement capability. Um, it's not a quantitative tool for generating a proposal ready STM, but it's sufficient to establish logic flow. And that's the idea behind what's coming next. We hope to, to put both of these out and make them live within the coming year in kind of the same way that we did with the knowledge base itself. Introduce it in a workshop style format, seek comment, allow for some beta testing, and then eventually have the working product. Um, and so finally, if any of this sounds of interest and, and you'd like to follow up, you'd like to become involved at any level, how can you do that? Um, I think it can be done in both individual ways and as we've heard, educational ways. Um, I realize that anything like this represents an ask of time and that time is really precious. And so I've tried to put things on here that represent both very modest amounts of time and effort and, and more substantive amounts of time and effort if you're interested. So simply as a user of existing content, um, not modifying content at all, you can browse, you can tell us what you think about how the system works. You can use it in a teaching capacity as Jen has done and actually as several other instructors have done. Um, if you think it's useful, spread the word to your colleagues, cite the knowledge base. I think the more we can gain use of the system, the more powerful it becomes as a tool uh, and, and becomes sort of self-reinforcing. You also can add content. So the whole system is designed to be interactive. It's designed to grow with user input. And there are multiple ways that you can do that. You can do something as simple as add a comment to an existing piece of evidence. I think the person who entered this evidence got it wrong um, for this reason. You as a user can enter a comment that gets captured in the system. And the whole point of this is not necessarily to seek consensus, but to understand that there will always be differences of opinion and to capture all of the arguments that underlie those differences. So you can add an argument. You can add a, uh, sorry, you can add a comment to an existing piece of evidence. You can add a new piece of evidence to an existing argument. I just published a paper that I think really bolsters this argument. This is how. You can create a new argument if you find that there's some critical thing that's missing from that. You can create an entire new entry. And I'll note here that one of the things that has happened in this project is it's given us an opportunity to see who raises their hand and self-identifies as a life detection person. And really missing from that community at the moment um, is the, the group of people who can comment in detail on the abiotic background. What are we trying to fish a signal of life out from? So for example, the origin of life community, the astromaterials community, that's very much needed. People who can comment on the activity category as, as Claire actually did in here, that content is very much needed also. And so we really would like your help in any of these areas. Uh, you can review submitted content. So every single entry, every single piece of information that you see in the knowledge base is peer reviewed in the way that a journal article would be. Um, it's peer reviewed by a, na a naive reviewer for clarity. Um, do I as a non-expert understand it? And it's peer reviewed for accuracy by an expert reviewer. Um, we need help in that area and that's not a, not a lot of, of energy to put in. Um, and finally, each one of these entries, as Graham mentioned, has a curator for it. And the curator's job is to make sure that information is sorted into the right place, that people are being accurate in their statements, um, and that kind of thing. So any of these represent potential ways to contribute if you're interested. And if you are, um, please contact Svetch Goliar at the address that you see on the bottom of the screen. And so with that, um, thank you so much for your attention. Thanks for coming. Um, thanks to Graham, Claire, and Jen. Uh, and we'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Uh, can you speak a little louder? Yes, I can. Thank you for uh, doing that, first of all, in not English, not just or not yet. But, uh, it's very cool to see all the pieces together. And I, I like the organization as well, which I think is really fun to look at. 
uh, my first question is, have you, you know, done the primary literature publication of it so that we could cite it and say, look, we use this tool to find this paper and, uh, and show it? Yeah, and, I, I, I think I understood correctly is, uh, have we published anything about yes. this? So um, we are, uh, we have in development a series of papers that will come out in a special issue of astrobiology, I'm hoping later this year, that will take each of the sort of levels of organization that I talked about and detail the rationale behind it in a paper. So there will be an ability both to look at the functionality of the system in the sort of help section online, but also to go in and understand all of the conversation and discussion that went into choosing this particular way of doing things and why we think it's appropriate. So. Um, My second question is, have you thought about making the detection of any one of those signals, you know, some sort of quantitative metric? Like if I see this, I'm, 90% confident it's life, and if I see this one and this one, I'm 95% confident it's life. And just, I, I know you mentioned the uh, yeah. looking for where we need to put more money, more science to understand particular components, but I just wonder if you... Yeah, the, so, so the quick answer is yes, we've thought about it. Um, it is a lot to tackle. And so there are a few different things that you could do here. One, one thing that's worth saying is, you know, we've, we've tried to boil things down to a level of granularity that, as I said, would sort of correspond to an individual science investigation um, in, a, in a mission or a science traceability matrix. In many cases, these are things that people would not accept as standalone evidence for life. So um, one example of where you go from here is some kind of combinatorics. How do you uh, use the system to recombine those different elements into something that might look like acceptable evidence and, and are they really independent and orthogonal? The thing that you're talking about is another thing that, that we've talked about. How do you introduce some probabilistic assessment? Um, I think that, that where we are now is that it's a significant amount of work to build the basis and evidence that should underlie any such calculation and we want to make sure that we get that right before we start thinking about that next step. Lucas Mix, really cool tool. Um, I think it's a wonderful way to teach uh, scientific, uh, sorry, a great way to teach how to do experiments uh, and how to justify your results as well. So I think that's wonderful. Very technical question. How did you populate your glossary? How did we populate our glossary? How did you decide which words go in and who gets to decide how they're defined? Um, we actually devoted a whole group whose job it was to, to go through. So the group included people who really hadn't been part and parcel to the discussions that led to all of this terminology. And a lot of the process really was, I've got no idea what that means. That should be in the glossary. Uh, and so we, we had a group that first um, developed those terms, a separate group that was a little bit more naive that reviewed them um, for clarity. And that was our process. Awesome. Thank nothing, you. nothing more specific than that. <clears throat> Hi, um, Chris Bradburn from APL. Um, so really great, thank you. I uh, really like the, the science traceability uh, aspect of the tool. Um, I'm wondering if you could just comment about how you handle conflict resolution or disagreements, you know, among value of particular literature or networks. Yes. Sorry, could you repeat one more time? How do you handle conflict resolution? For opinions on papers and yeah, very very important question. So, um, in a sense, the 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 system is designed to encompass conflict um, and lay it bare, so that people can see that you know there there wasn't you know there wasn't necessarily a resolution that it can remain an open argument. And so, the ability to do that is uh, several fold. So, at the level of an argument. Um, you can, as a user, go in and create a linked counter argument that says, this is wrong because. Um, so the ability to create a new argument depends on citing literature that supports it. Uh, nothing appears without a, a connection to the literature. So at that level, you can create a counter argument. You can, at the level of evidence, enter a comment that says, this person got it wrong. Um, and, and this is why I think so, uh, and I'm going to cite this piece of literature to, to support my case. So the very first level at which that happens is the level of review. Uh, if, if, you know, just as in peer review, you may have a reviewer who comes back and says, I completely disagree, um, there has to be some resolution. 
Uh, and, and one possible resolution is that the reviewer writes a counter argument, right? So, so the initial argument gets placed in the knowledge base, the reviewer writes a counter argument. But um, I think that's an important area that I maybe rushed over a little bit is, is the notion that, you know, so often we go through some process, emerge with an answer, and all of the value that's le that, that, that relates to the discussion that underlay that answer um, can kind of get lost when that goes away and we just take the answer at face value. The purpose of this is to place the value on the discussion itself and then leave it to a proposer, say, to take those arguments, give them some weight and say, this is what I think the, the appropriate way forward is, or this is why this is the best thing to use. Um, so we are not trying to, um, create a way to, to necessarily weigh the arguments, but rather to let the arguments just be established and let, let users um, go where they think with it. So as the arguments, as the arguments build up over time, everything made out. Um, yeah, that certainly is the idea. Jen, did you want to add something? I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's very much the idea. And, and the, other, the other notion behind the system is, you know, there are many cases where for a given biosignature or suite of biosignatures, there'll be a, a very substantive, important paper that comes out and captures the state of the art at that time. And then time passes and maybe something else important happens and, and you know that sort of gets lost. And so the idea here has been to create a way to track in real time on sort of a living basis how our thinking about it evolves and emerges. Thank you. Yep, thanks. Antigona Segura from the National University in Mexico. Um, it, this is a great tool. Thank you. I, I saw us learn how to write a paper by doing it, and it was like painful. <laughs> what <laughs> wasn't it though? <laughs> yes. So it, it, it is great that you have done this. But I was curious about um, when you use the, the Atacama Desert experiments for for. Um, the Viking experiment. I was curious about uh, how the students respond when they saw the Beeman response, which has a lot of arguments, but has some adjectives too that doesn't seem like it should be in science. But I mean, because most of my, my students, when they read that, I, I made them read the both papers. Yep. So they, they are very surprised about this. And I, I was wondering how the, how the students take that and what do they learn if it's the same experience as I have in Mexico, or is this different? Yeah. Like we have, um, we have I, a special relationship with that paper. He was my advisor, so my PhD advisor, so it's like special for us. But I wanted to know about people who is not, who has not that link. <laughs> yeah, um, great questions. And maybe I could ask Jen and Claire to weigh in on that, since um, that specifically was what you were looking at. Can you repeat it? Repeat it. Yeah, so, um, so to make sure that I understood correctly, um, how how did you you know the, the the literature that came around at that time was lively um, as as it sometimes is and when you encountered that if I'm understanding the question correctly um, how did you feel about trying to to sort of capture that in the knowledge base and, and yeah, it was very passionate the, the, the discussion about the the Viking experiment because there were I mean it was not only the papers but it was. Uh, a huge deal in the, in the press, and, and I think several of those papers have the same thing. That there was things in the, in the paper. So, for the students' respond when they saw that science is not only um, these arguments, but it, there are some passions there that are that are presented in papers, <laughs> which is which. Yeah. I don't know. It's surprising. When I was yeah. Um. Yeah, sorry, it's a little hard to hear up here, but um, I think, yeah, I think we, um, I think we did that even more probably with, we had more people focused on the McKay paper and we split that up into uh, more categories. So uh, I'm sorry to, to kind of uh, not focus on the Viking as much, but, um, uh, but I can comment on, um, I think we went into more detail on the McKay and everybody got to read many, many papers. So we might have represented that one a little more in detail, whereas I think the, the Viking one, as opposed to focusing on all the literature from the 70s, we kind of zoomed forward a little bit and focused more on the per perchlorate, which I don't think they knew right from the 70s. 
They were six. Okay, here I'll. Yeah. You want to go more into yeah, depth? Yeah. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think the the focus on the more recent literature, um, to a point, was kind of just time constraint. Um, and being in the the NASA office hours, it was like. Per, there's there's um, even within the subject of perchlorate, there is a enough for me to have a substantial a substantial argument to add to the knowledge base. I think there are a lot of papers that came out of the Viking lander experiments that can definitely be explored. Um, but I think the focus for that was just essentially I, you know, part of the project was to find a very specific set of papers. Um, that are highly relevant to a very specific argument. Um, so I think there could be a multitude of other arguments that could be added um, to that specific section of the database. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, that was great. You know, I will say one really interesting thing that, that, that came out of these discussions in the office hours um, is that we went through, I'll just talk about the McKay one, for instance, we went through every piece of evidence, which I had actually done as an undergrad with Roger Buick at one point as well, and then got to go back as a professor now and look through all these. And we went through biotic and abiotic on every single one of those items. And the one that we, I challenged someone to find, an Emmy, if Emmy's here, it was her, if it was her, Emmy Hughes, is, is, who's a, um, one of our students and is at this conference. We were looking for abiotic ways of magnetite, um, align, nanomagnetite alignment and the, the way it's aligned in that meteorite. And we could not find any abiotic way to do that so far. So that's something, it just forces you to really hunt, you know, for these, um, you know, abiotic mechanisms. So, so far, that's the only thing that still stands, as far as I know, from the uh, McKay paper. We still can't find abiotic way of doing that. So, kind of cool. Hi, um, my name is Erica Antil, and I had two questions. The first one actually dovetails on the previous question a little bit, where um, I was wondering, since this is a platform, it, also, really great talk, by the way, <laughs> and really great system. Since this is a platform where it seems like you have the potential for a lot of users, are there going to be like community guidelines or some way of structuring it so that people, um, you know, there's not <laughs> unscientific, uh, you know, kind of feelings going going into some of those commentary in the back and forth that's going to be maintained? Still hear me? Or should I just? There we go. Um, so great question. I, I think there are two levels to that. Um, one is that, that each entry is curated. And so if you're actually adding new content, there is a person there who's, you know, who, who's not weighing, you know, this is right or wrong, but is there to help deal with the kind of thing that you're talking about, right? Um, I think we have something built into the way that we uh, engage new users, Graham, do we? Yeah. Um, this one? This one? Um, yeah, so we don't actually have like a community guidelines set up right now for new users. Um, but whenever you, you try to provide a comment or, or a new argument or piece of evidence, um, it doesn't actually become visible to anyone else until it's been vetted by our curators um, to make sure, one, that there's no spam, but also to make sure there's no you know, harassing language or any of those kinds of issues that come up as well. Um, but it is a good point. We, we have really haven't addressed you know, like guidelines for community behavior necessarily yet, but I feel like at least this way we have some built-in process to avoid any major issues that could come up. Awesome. That makes sense. Thank you. Um, and the other question that I'd had is that, you know, you mentioned um, needing more input on some of the abiotic aspects, and I wondered if you had considered collaborating um, further outside maybe the traditional astrobiology community with, like, you know, chemistry and geology societies or other places to, to try to draw a little bit more on the non-biological knowledge base. Yeah, def definitely yes. Um, so, so we have in the works, um, maybe for late this year or early next year, a workshop that will kind of focus on the abiotic background specifically. And the, the purpose is not just to help understand the state of the art from that community's perspective, but it's, it's to engage those communities and let them know their relevance to, to what's going on now. Um, 
abiotic background is, is easily half of what we need to understand in order to do this right. And the communities that, that have the most relevance to doing that, I think haven't necessarily perceived their relevance. And so, so a good bit of our job is outreach and engagement. We have a person who's dedicated to doing that. Um, and, and we try to engage through the RCNs, through the AGs, um, and, and even through uh, conferences representing some of the groups that you're talking about um, to try to let them know what we have going. Um, and it is always an ask, right? You're, you're asking for people's time. Um, but, but that is expertise that I think if we, as a community, want to do um, you know, our missions right, we'll need to tap. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you all so much for your time and for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it.